great. Yeah, good turnout today. A lot of yeah, people. I mean, yeah. we've had some good ones. I think uh, last week we had like 86 people. Oh, wow. Um, I, I haven't thought that was yet. <laughs> that was good. That's very good. And I was so happy, I mean, and I was so happy because right as soon as I started letting people in the waiting room, my router, my modem oh, died. I had such a hard time. Oh, last and week. here's yeah. Doshi. I don't see her. <laughs> no, I don't see her either. Uh, I love her work. Oh my God, I went to her website. Her work is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Doshi. Hi, how are you? So good to see you. I just got your email. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm counting on your creativity to get my juices going. Oh, we got a lot of good creative people. It's early there, huh, Doshi? Yeah, it's six. I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Look very good for six. I, you know, I'm you usually do. doing my workout by this time, so I tend to uh, get up at four. <laughs> wow. Whoa. I'm an early morning her, person. I find that I get up earlier every year. <laughs> that earlier, too. <laughs> I got you beat 3.30 this morning, but not, oh, wow. by, intention. <laughs> not by intention. <laughs> Oh, goodness. How's the weather in California, Doshi? Um, it's going up to the high 60s during the day, but it's it's 46 right now. Wow. We, I'm, you know, because I'm on the coast, we get that cold, foggy mornings. Right. And then I wait for it to warm up. <laughs> Suzanne, I can't hear you. Uh, Lindsay, unmute. I don't know why she can't hear. Where is she? Oh. oh, all right. Can you hear me now, Lindsay? Oh, you got a two fit. You got your face behind. You got you on your flute behind you. Mm, that's pretty. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just after nine. We can go ahead and get started. And people will probably. You're muted. Wow. All right. I guess I muted myself when I unmuted. <laughs> when I unmuted Lindsay. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone and welcome Doshi for joining us so early on a Sunday morning. Um, so we can get started and I'll let Doshi talk a little bit while we, um, while I continue admitting people, and maybe she can start by telling us how your creative journey started. Okay, I can do that. Um, my uh, career, I guess we'd call it, started as a uh, costume designer in theater. So the, uh, my studies were all theater related. And it was, uh, it became more and more important to me to be able to create the fabrics that I was using in my costume design. So we had um, in grad school, uh, we had a guest come and, and uh, teach us about dying, uh, dying for the theater it was called. 
Um, and that certainly captured my attention. And then the, uh, the excitement of being able to create your own fabric to create your designs uh, became more and more important to me. Um, and I was given a Midsummer Night's Dream to design. <coughs> and that absolutely called for creating all of the fabric. So that is when I discovered Shibori. Um, I found the book, Yoshika Wada's book, and uh, which is Shibori, the inventive art or of, fab, of dying. I don't remember the whole title. Um, and so I studied that and started creating the fabric for that show. And then it became, uh, it became my love. So instead of going back to designing a, a lot of theater, I started exploring Shibori more and more and um, was fortunate enough to take a class with Zandra Rhodes, um, who some of you may know, a British designer. And she does a lot of silk screening of her fabrics. And she asked me why I was doing shibori for theater instead of doing it for fashion, uh, which I thought was a good question. <laughs> so she hired me to create some um, sheath dresses to go along with her caftans. And really that's what got me started, completely going into shibori. So, I um, pretty much uh, left my costume design career and started dyeing fabric instead. And, um, but I continued in costume design as a teacher. I taught an MFA program at the California State University, Long Beach. So I continued in theater as a mentor and teacher uh, and obviously taught dying along with it. <laughs> so, um, and I really, uh, I just so enjoy being out in the studio and being able to create fabric and experiment and discover new ways to get fabric and to get the dye into the fabric in exciting, creative ways. Okay, that's great. Um, do you sketch product before you start or, or does your work just kind of evolve? Well, lots of times, um, you know, I'll see, uh, I'll see a, a, a fashion design that I think is exciting. And, uh, and I'll think of a, a, a fabric that would look fabulous in that. And I will start uh, trying to figure out how to get there. And, um, and as you experiment, other things than what you thought you were aiming toward happen, <laughs> especially with Shibori. And um, so I may start heading towards something, but I don't always end up there, uh, which I usually find very exciting. Um, and because I teach workshops, I'm always excited by the participants, um, you know, experimenting and something will come out again that's unexpected. Uh, and then I may spend time trying to recreate that, figure out how that happened. Um, so it's a combination of uh, you know, is it the design of the garment that I fall in love with or the design of the fabric that I fall in love with? Um, and then I'll get a piece of fabric that I don't know what to make in it and let it sit on the shelf for a while until something uh, happens, appears into my head finally, or uh, the other may happen and I keep a design, a, a, uh, fashion design that I want to play with and finally work my way into the fabric. It's always chance, I think. Chance and uh, um, 
the willingness to, to just play with your dyes and your fabric. Because there's so many incredible um, ways you can create resist dyeing and it just creates some incredible things on your fabric. So Rebecca just asked, what are your preferred dyes? I like to work with acid dyes. I work almost exclusively in silk. Uh, and in the winter, I do do some wool, so it's still a, a protein dye. Um, I use a commercial dye called Keystone. Uh, it's a Keystone Aniline Dye Company, which is out of Chicago. And <clears throat> I started with those in theater. Um, and I just love the, the colors that I get from their primaries. So I started with those, wow, 35 years ago. And, uh, and those are what I still use. Um, I have uh, worked with the wash fast acids from um, Pro Chemical and uh, I enjoy those as well. But I start with all primaries that and um, mix all my own colors, which is also very fun to do. Yeah. Um, so do you still, when you do your shibori, I know after you do it for a long time, you kind of have an, you know pretty much, or you hope you know. <laughs> um, do you still get that surprise package? Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's one of the most fun parts of shibori is you've got this, you know, piece of fabric that's all wadded up and you take it apart and wow, look what happened. <laughs> so yeah, I still do, which is, which is some of the joy of, um, of experimenting. I think that's what keeps us going. I do too. Oh. It's like constantly opening a gift. What do you do with your uglies? Um, <laughs> oh, come on. Really? Yes. I, get it. I, I have things that um, either the colors set next to each other in not a very attractive way, or I didn't get, uh, I didn't get the result I was hoping for. So I may often over dye that or um, lots of times I will discharge the fabric and start over. Um, and sometimes, not that often, but sometimes <laughs> it just has to be completely recycled into a mock-up or something <laughs> that's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I think we all have those piles, you know. Um, and I find myself, I'm able to sometimes rework them. Or the, uh, the other part is sometimes the pieces I think are really, really ugly. Somebody will walk in and they'll go, oh my God, that's just beautiful. And it's like, oh, you know, and I, so I think maybe, do you, do you think sometimes that you are overly critical of yourself um, when? Yeah, I, I um, one, one instance, recent instance in particular, <clears throat> I was uh, working with a new um, wrap and I didn't get very much color into the, the wrapped fabric. So there was still a lot of uh, white left behind and I thought it was um, completely unattractive. Uh, and I do have a, um, an assistant that works with me a couple of days a week in the studio and she loved it. She loved it. No, come on, let's cut it. Let's cut it. Let's do it anyway. And we did. And I have had more orders for that piece of fabric than, uh, so yes, often we look at something very critically instead of standing back and seeing it objectively. Didn't have as much color in it as I wanted. And therefore, in my mind, it didn't work. Yeah, I think we have our own, you know, color preferences that we really like. And so we, we sometimes tend to stick to the colors that we like without thinking about, you know, what 
our clients might like. You know, um, do you have particular color palettes that are your favorites? I have, uh, <clears throat> yes, and I try to uh, break out of those. Um, I, I love the oranges and reds and uh, golden yellows. Um, my galleries prefer the purples and blues and teals. So I find myself, I make the reds and yellows for myself. <laughs> and occasionally a gallery will like those, but most of the time I have to keep experimenting in the blues, purples, and teals, which I also like. But I love lime green, love lime green. Um, and actually that's in almost all of my fabrics. It's a nice little punch color that adds um, a visual uh, impact. And so um, lime green, and then I love a, a red violet that I also add to a lot of my work. Lots of times I'll underpaint with the red violet because it makes the other colors pop. And it adds that, both of those add a warm, cool uh, to the piece, which the eye enjoys because the warms come toward us and the cools push away. And then there's activity in the, in the fabric that our eye enjoys looking at. <clears throat> I know um, when I first started talking to you about doing a workshop in the studio, you, you were waiting to retire. Have you retired from? Yes, I did. And it actually couldn't have been a more perfect time because um, when we went into lockdown, I was teaching a dye class at the university and it was very difficult to move to Zoom um, when the students didn't have their lab or um, I couldn't do the demonstrations in person. Um, so I started, uh, I would do a, a, a process and photograph as I went. Um, I didn't have, I remember you talked with, um, uh, about videoing, um, you know, doing a video workshop and things. And uh, I just didn't have access to that. Uh, so it was very difficult. So it was a huge relief when the semester ended, I think for the students and myself, <laughs> um, because they were trying to dye things in their homes or in their apartments. Uh, and uh, it was a relief then to not try to translate all of my in-person, hands-on demonstration work for classes. Yeah, I think dying is a very difficult thing to teach online. Uh, <sighs> yeah. So many supplies and so much, you know, the amount of stuff that I have in the studio to do a class with. Uh, even to go teach it someplace else when I have to pack my right. carry all that stuff someplace, it's just overwhelming. Um, and so I think that's why I didn't jump into online teaching. Have you since done anything with um, Zoom or online? Or um, yes, because um, I was fortunate enough to have a former student and good friend. Um, who has a YouTube channel that she does. And she uh, came and videoed a studio tour for me. And um, just the um, having someone who knows what they're doing and how to edit and how to put it all together was a huge difference. Um, and uh, so we've talked about putting together a, uh, a class that would be an online class. So we're, we're still talking about doing that. Yeah, it's a big transition to go over. Um, so when you were during the, um, during COVID, do you work in your studio every day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you um, have like a daily routine that you do or does it just kind of flow? 
Um, not really a daily routine. I, I, uh, I like to be out in the studio by eight o'clock and the, um, the shorter days in the winter, I like to be done by four because it starts um, chilling down about three. Um, but I, and the routine always changes depending on what I need to get done. If I have an order to fill, I set up a schedule to work on that order. And then other things get, you know, slid off the uh, docket because I have um, deadlines to meet. Uh, and things like, um, I'm, you know, you, uh, I need to do an alteration to a, one of my own garments and that seems to get pushed further and further away all the time. Uh, so, and I, I have a seamstress who works for me and I, um, so I have that deadline always. I wanna make sure she has work. Um, so the, the schedule stays the same from trying to do an eight to five. Um, but what I do during the day changes all the time. I know that um, when you're doing unique one of a kind pieces of clothing, you know, you always have people who come in, they'll go, oh, do you have that in another size? <laughs> I, do you have to make, do you make large quantities of the same fabric or try to recreate the same fabric or? I, I still do one at a time. Um, when I'm working toward a new colorway, lots of times I'll do, uh, when it comes out what I'm looking for, then I will repeat it right away and do another piece. Uh, so I'll have uh, an extra piece of that fabric. Um, and then I do repeat, uh, galleries often order more than one size in a fabric. Um, and the more I do that particular fabric, the better I get at repeating it. And they all explain to clients that it never comes out exactly the same which is necessary because it doesn't. Uh, so, I, so I see, I always dye the amount for a single blouse. And really in Shibori, that's about all you can do to get on a pole or on a, uh, some kind of resist that'll fit in your dye pot. So most of the time that's um, six, just under two yards of fabric is what I dye at a time. So do you do <laughs> your own, I'm um, dyeing in an indoor studio or an outdoor studio or? No, I have, um, my actual dye process is outdoors. I have um, uh, burners, big propane burners outside and a, really a very nice large dye area that's outside. Uh, so the weather dictates whether something's getting done or not, because if it's raining, which thank goodness in Southern California, we don't rain that much. Um, but when it's really cold, it's hard to work outside too. And I'm a wimp when it comes to uh, 40, 46 degrees is way cold to me. Um, so those of you, in all of the snowstorms, forgive me, but I really am a total wimp with the, with cold weather. Um, so yeah, my dye area itself is outside. Um, I have uh, big cutting spaces indoors, big cutting tables, and uh, uh, I do most of the wrapping inside as well. That's cool. Um... So you mix, I mean, do you keep large container, uh, large pots of dye, large dye vats? Understood. Um, what I do, I have, do have very large pots, big stainless steel restaurant size <clears throat> pots. And um, 
I have, uh, they're called carboys, five gallon carboys that are big plastic jugs um, that I will uh, keep my, I call it my vat dyes in. I have about, I probably have 20 of those or so that are stored under my um, dye table. And so I, my vat dyes, I keep in those and then refresh as they start to um, get paler and paler. Um, and then I keep all of my primary colors in uh, concentrated liquid form. I buy powder and then make up uh, one gallon bottles of my primary colors and keep those um, in stock so that when I'm mixing color, I already have my, um, my liquids that I can mix from. Uh, and that saves a lot of time. So some days um, I may spend a few hours just mixing up my powder dyes into liquid concentrates and do all of that at one time <clears throat> with all of your, you know, protective equipment on. What, um, how do you prepare your silk for dyeing? Um, most of the time I just uh, <laughs> use hot water and either um, a, a, a detergent like a Synthropol. Um, and silk is, is much more resilient than most people uh, think. Uh, 180 degrees is what the dye bath is at. And my, I have a hot water on demand that I have uh, set at 180 degrees. So I can fill my washing machine with 180 degree water and uh, do a, a wash of the, um, of uh, Synthropol and, and fabric to prep it for dyeing. And then I hang dry everything. So I got a message from Joan Goodspeed. Oh, yes. She says she could share the studio tour video link if, if, if you don't mind. No, Joan is the person who created that for me. So that would be nice if she could share that link and then everybody could check out your studio. And oh, she already did it. She's <laughs> She's quick. Uh, Lisa asked if you have a picture and a fold you might show us. A picture of what? A picture and a fold that you might show us. Um, of a fold? A fold, I think she's... Oh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just emailed some... Um, Actually, let me think. The studio tour has some of that on it. And oh, I know I can open this. I have to put it on my desktop uh, in order to, to show it. <clears throat> well, that's okay. We can check it probably in the studio tour. Okay. So do you think your creativity's changed since you got older? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, certainly the impulse to create has never changed. Um, the, uh, the, the enjoyment, the joy that comes from, uh, for me, dying, um, color, not dying, the, uh, the joy has never changed at all. I think what has changed is because I have several years of experience that I understand more about uh, what I'm doing in terms of wrapping something. Um, so some of the questions that I get when I'm teaching you know, like sometimes your fabric twists as you're putting it on a rope. Uh, and that really doesn't affect the 
way the dye sits on top of that fabric. There's all kinds of things that um, through experience, I understand. So, um, so some of that experimenting doesn't have to happen anymore because I've already figured that part out. Um, the, the joy of doing something new or trying something new has never left. Like right now, I've just started um, working with some echo print because I want to incorporate some of that into uh, some wall pieces that I'm doing. Uh, and that's very exciting and completely different from what I've done before. So I think as you get older, um, you just get hopefully a little wiser. <laughs> you certainly gain a little wisdom. Um, whether we actually get wiser or not is, up, uh, is a toss up, I suppose. But um, I have a better understanding of how long something is going to take me to get done. Um, I plan my days a little bit differently. So all of those things. I take um, a really good lunch break, which I didn't used to do. I used to just get food and keep working while I, <laughs> while I ate. Um, so maybe downtime has become a little bit more important as I've aged. I think sometimes too, um, when you start off and something is just a studio practice and you're not really doing it um, to produce items to sell, um, I don't know if, if it changes for you the making of things and you know it becomes more of a sometimes it becomes more of a job to make that stuff than being creative um, and then the administrative part of running the business can sometimes be overwhelming do you sometimes put find yourself to be in a trap of just being overwhelmed or oh, too busy doing too many different tracks of out running a, a business that produces things? Um, yes, I do. Uh, especially when I have orders coming in. Um, and during the, the lockdowns, um, not having uh, my assistant come in uh, all the time. Um, you know, observing our distance and uh, being careful. Uh, so yes, I do sometimes get overwhelmed, but I've learned actually through theater because theater is constant deadlines. You know, opening night is still gonna be opening night. First dress is still gonna be first dress. That I get out the calendar and I put down what has to get done every day. Um, and meet those deadlines on a daily basis. And once it's on paper, it's not nearly as overwhelming. Uh, and um, I, I do do a meditation practice every day. Um, in fact, at seven o'clock, I have my meeting with my sensei every Sunday at seven. Uh, so I think Part of aging is also uh, being able to control that horrid sense of um, everything running away from you and you're not able to get it all done in time. Um, I feel a lot more confident in scheduling out everything. In fact, I did a to-do list um, earlier this week because I'm piling up with orders uh, and I don't want to get behind. So I think there are ways uh, <laughs> to simplify our life. And, um, and some of that really is in scheduling out everything. It's like the outside things are what get to me like, oh my gosh, I got to get my taxes done now. And I've got, <laughs> you know, I had to get 1099s done. And I had, so those are the things that tend to, um, get to me, not so much my creative work uh, or filling orders. It's more of the, uh, when am I gonna sit down and do that? Those are the things that I have to 
schedule. So, you know, now in the evening, I come in and spend an hour dealing with um, the retail sales tax return or all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that, you know, as artists who are also entrepreneurs, you know, the, the business side um, is a huge important part of it. And for a lot of artists, you know, that's the overwhelming part. They, they have a hard time dealing with the website and, mm. orders and doing all the accounting and everything. Um, I found myself, I mean, I have to make lists. And then I think the biggest thing that I've learned this year for me, because this time last year, I was feeling on top of the world. I had my whole year of, of classes scheduled out. I had all my paperwork from my instructors in, and I thought my, my year was gonna be great. And so I think this, this year for me has just been how to be a little bit more accepting of flux and make changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think the biggest thing you've learned this year during uh, COVID has been? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, interestingly, what has uh, seemed a little overwhelming is all of the resources that have become available from museums and artist talks and all of the wonderful um, things at Surface Design Association and the textile arts of Los Angeles. And there are so many of these things that I want to attend uh, and I don't, I don't have time for all of that. Um, and sometimes that's the part that feels overwhelming because I would like to, uh, you know, participate in uh, a Zoom call that I really just don't have time to do, which happened this Friday, actually. Um, and all of the resources are just so incredible. And so I bookmark or add to my reading list several things that I'd like to watch and, and do. Uh, and that list seems to just be, keep getting longer and longer. Um, and I have trouble finding time to get into those. Uh, I, I um, have never been a TV person, so I don't, I don't spend time on TV, but I love things like the master classes and um, I love to cook uh, mm -hmm. and even just carving out a lot of time to sit and cook because I wanna make pasta or you know, start from scratch with things. Um, so during COVID, uh, it has seemed to add more to-dos. I just don't have the commute that I needed to do before. So the commute time um, has been taken away, which is pretty great, I think. Uh, but I do, I do miss, uh, I do miss um, some of the in-person, um, especially now playing with this echo printing. I would love to have uh, an actual workshop where I can say, okay, now what are you soaking that in or what are you doing that in? <clears throat> but otherwise, you know, having your studio right next to you out your back door, this is my back door, <laughs> um, it, uh, it's, heaven to be able to just walk outside and go to work. So COVID has been a, uh, a blessing in many ways for me. Have you done any echo printing? Oh yeah, I, I've started. I started on some watercolor paper. Um, I've done one, one piece of silk so far. Um, so, and mostly with eucalyptus and geraniums because they're right here. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's another package that you open up and you're surprised all the time. I know. Really. Um, one of the, um, the echo print classes I teach, I actually use uh, acid dye blanket on top of the prints to get a, a, a background on silks in, in color. Um, Donate. It makes an interesting <laughs> process um, 
to, to do it. So you have other creative channels that you, you do besides, you said you like to cook. Yeah, I love to cook. I, I like garden. to garden. I love to garden. Um, and uh, I, I enjoy doing watercolors and uh, sketching there. One of, the, one of the things I do miss from this is whenever I went out of town, I would take my uh, watercolor pencils and sketchbook and spend time uh, doing sketches. And, uh, and I've really left that behind because, you, you know, I kind of had a, a time where that was going to happen. And I obviously am not traveling. So I don't have that, that time carved out for myself. Um, it's a good way to pass uh, time on an airplane to sit and sketch. Uh, so there's something I left out. I hadn't even thought about that. So Betsy asked if you've ever created your shibori on handmade paper. Uh, actually, yes, I have. Um, and I enjoy doing that a lot. Uh, I've used um, uh, in Santa Monica, a beautiful uh, paper store called Iranmi, and uh, they have all different weights of uh, Kozo papers, handmade papers, um, and I have a good friend who uh, makes paper. So uh, I've done, I actually have quite a nice stash of shibori on paper. Uh, that I used to make lampshades out of. I just haven't made any lately. That's interesting. I've never thought of doing it on paper before, um, but I can see how it would work. Do you have a favorite type and weight of silk you like to work on? Um, I, if I were to pick a favorite, uh, I think it would be right now crepe. I enjoy working on a 16 or 18 mummy crepe. Um, when I first started, I worked a great deal on uh, a chiffon. Um, and it was a, actually, I started often with black and discharged. Uh, I saw somebody, I use uh, sodium hydrosulfate to uh, for discharge and that black as I discovered and this was when I first started so I didn't understand it uh, all of a sudden uh, the black that I ordered didn't discharge anymore to this beautiful shade of uh, beige it uh, was a mucky gray um, so I had to learn that uh, a lot of companies over dye fabric that didn't sell with black. And so if you get that pile of fabric, your discharge is very different. Um, so I started with, sorry, I'll get back to the question. <laughs> I started with chiffon and organzas, loved working in organza. Uh, and then when that black happened, I shifted to a completely different set of fabrics. Uh, I went through a phase of working on a silk linen that I absolutely loved because I could dye the silk one color and the linen another color using two different dye types. Um, and then I shifted into uh, working with silk broadcloth. Uh, which takes the dye very differently from the silk crepe that I'm working with now. And I usually have several different uh, fabrics uh, in my quote line uh, that I'm working on. Do you ever work on cottons or linens? Um, only under duress. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I like the silk linen blends. Um, I uh, find working with fiber reactive dyes uh, more difficult than working with my acid dyes. So um, I tend to shy away from the cellulosic fibers. Uh, when I did work with the silk linen blends, I worked with direct dye. 
which um, dyes your cellulosic fiber. Um, so uh, I'm, I love silk. I just really, really enjoy how the silk takes the color. And it's maybe because I haven't worked with the cotton enough to understand how the cotton will take that color. Have you thought about using natural dyes at all? Um, only through this process of the uh, echo printing. And um, part of the reason for that is the uh, um, light fastness and wash fastness of natural dyes. And since I do clothing, uh, in, it is, I find it more difficult to work with the natural dyes and sell that than I do working with my acid dyes. Yeah, I have that same, that's my same feeling. I'm just, I know how the light fastness, fastness is on natural dyes and it just terrifies me to sell something that somebody might bring back to me and say that it faded. Um, and so most people that I know who do sell their work um, are still working with, with the dyes and um, yeah, with synthetics that are a little more, yeah, that won't fade as quickly, you know, um, gotta keep getting more people. So, um, let's see. Well, let's see. I can, um, I order my fabrics from, uh, I, there's LA, which they haven't this year, they have an LA textile show uh, for um, business. And so I usually go to that and find different suppliers for my fabrics. I love finding different fabrics. Um, I order a great deal from exotic silks. Um, I have ordered some things from Dharma, um, but I have the LA wholesale district, which, uh, I haunt on occasion to find interesting fabrics as well. Yeah, they're kind of, the, the fabric districts are fun to just kind of wander through. And yeah, we have a district in Miami, uh, fabric district, and sometimes you can go down there. A lot of it is um, just for seamstresses. Um, you can find some great embellished fabrics. Um, which are great for people who do like costuming and, and different things like that. But occasionally you can find some really nice um, fabrics to dye on. And they're just like one of a kind limited pieces because you don't know where they're going to come from. Right. <laughs> or you know, when you're going to get it again. <laughs> or when you're going to get it again. And, and those, are the, those are what I found will end up happening is those are the pieces that people are going to love and they're going to want more of. So they, you have to keep getting, be able to get more uh, fabrics. So um, I don't know. I was going to open the question up to see if anybody else had any questions. Um, and actually, if, if you have a question, um, maybe you can, we can unmute and just ask Doji um, and see if what, how we are. So I know she has her appointment to get to. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Doshi, uh, um, when you, regarding the silk linen, do you um, prepare that silk linen differently than regular silk before dyeing? Uh, no, exactly the same. Okay. And you mentioned that you use different dyes. Mm -hmm. The acid dye will dye only the protein fiber. Mm -hmm. And then I use a direct dye, which dyes the cellulosic fiber. Now, and what is a direct dye? I've never heard well, of a direct it's dye. A, it's a different type of dye. They're, um, a, a, I think ProChemical sells direct dyes, I'm not sure, or maybe they don't anymore, but um, it is, there's, there's many, many different types of dye that have different affinities for different types of fiber. 
And a direct dye is a type of dye that has an affinity for the cellulosic. And um, I, I get those out of uh, North Carolina, the um, standard dyes sells a really lovely direct dye. Um, so it's just a different dye type, like fiber reactive is a different dye type. Uh, okay. Fat dyes are a different dye type. Great. Um, and uh, you can Great. find information on Paula Birch's website which is very extensive information about different types of dyes. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is Lavinia Humphrey. And I, I just love your little skateboard <laughs> oh, thing that okay. you use to wrap around. And I was just wondering, how did you come up with that idea? And to me, I have a lot of arthritis in my hands. So mm. I've gotten to the point now where it's you know, less picking up things and holding them tight. But that thing seems so easy. I was just wondering, do you have directions for that? Or did you, do you have, uh, do you sell them or what, what do you do? Oh, no, um, my, my father uh, was a handyman, very much so. And um, when I showed him what I was, uh, you know, doing, trying to wrap this fabric on a pole, uh, he's the one who suggested using casters. So you go to Home Depot, you pick up a piece of wood and four casters and screw those casters to your piece of wood. And the distance um, depends on what size pole you work on. I like to work on uh, three to four feet, actually three feet now. Um, and then how far apart they are, um, you know, this way depends on the width of your pole. So I have some that are small to work with my um, four inch diameter, and then some that are further apart to work with my seven and eight inch diameter. And uh, so it's, I like to buy the um, particle board that has like a white, uh, not, it's not a painted finish. I'm not sure what, what finish that is on that wood, but um, that way you can drip on it and wipe it up and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect the wood itself because it's protected. Um, and so I literally, I love to uh, walk the aisles of Home Depot and go, hmm, I wonder if I could use that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> and I was wondering, how about that space in between the wheels? Do you have something that where the pole can rest in between the wheels or no? No, it wants to be uh, about an inch and a half off of the um, wood itself. So it wants to be elevated. So the wheels have to be close enough to hold the edges of the pole and keep it up off of the, the piece of wood itself. I think it, it just looked like you had some kind of a scoopy little something that to fill in the distance between the wheels so that when you put the pole down the the curve part you know just sits in the middle of that but I guess not okay thank you so much that is so mm -hmm. wonderful and it, it does make it much easier because you're not struggling and I I have had arthritis for years and it makes a huge difference right well I love your work thank you oh thank you yeah, my Steve built the same type thing for me, and I have them mounted on boards um, for different sizes in the studio, too. Um, it really makes a big difference. Do you have any other tools that you use um, that, are, that are good to use? I see Kathy says she sometimes uses a Lazy Susan. Instead. Oh, yes. I tried a Lazy Susan for a while, and, and that helped a great deal, too. Yeah, that I find works really good for, you know, larger Rashi pieces also. Um, particularly like if I have a big tube, like an eight inch or something, except that the weight of the tube would sometimes be overwhelming on top of the Lazy Susan and not make it turn quite as easily. Um, uh, the only other tool I use a lot are um, clamps, the uh, spring clamps. Um, because I do a lot of tesuji, which is wrapped on a hollow core, and I use um, rope to do those um, wraps. Um, I use those to uh, clamp 
the rope at one end to hold it taut. Um, and when I'm doing kumo knots or knots of some kind, I use that to grab my fabric. Um, so, and then uh, most of it is obviously your hands. They're good tools. Your hands are good tools, but <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm starting to feel like my fingers crink crinking up a little bit sometimes, you know, so when I start to lose my hands, that's going to be a terrible, a terrible thing, you know, I think we have to kind yeah. of protect our hands. Yeah. I do do a lot of um, hand exercises to, um, for my wrists and my hands to keep them keep the muscle toned and be able to use them. I know when I've had uh, interns come to work with me from San Diego State, um, they uh, spend one 40 hour week with me and after the first day they come in the next day going, my hands hurt. It is, it's a lot of hands crumping and you know tightening and everything. So it's good to, to exercise them. I think that's the biggest problem that I've seen in most of my classes is that most Chibori artists don't get things tight enough. And so there is a lot of strength required in getting these a good tension and good tightness in your in your fabric on everything. Um, does anybody else have any questions before we I don't think so. I think everybody's pretty much gone. Well, I really want to thank everybody for showing up this week and taking your Sunday to join us. Um, Joshi is scheduled to teach at the IF Fiber Studio. That we've rescheduled her to the end of May, God willing, that things are going to be okay. Um, and um, we'd love to have you join us if you're interested in coming. Um, the studio is, I've done a lot to make it very safe and a lot of social distancing. I also have a large outdoor dye area and we have a lot of fresh air because we're right on the waterfront. Um, so we have a lot of fresh air going through the studio to keep things safe. Um, Suzanne. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got here late and this is, I just learned about the series last night. I'm wondering if any of the prior talks are available or recorded and available for us to see. Uh, I have a couple I need to go back in. I save them to my computer. So I have to go back in after I save them to the computer and edit them and put them on and release them either on YouTube or um, someplace, Vimeo or, or whatever. I just haven't done that yet. Okay, um, thanks. Well, I'll keep uh, in touch then. <laughs> yeah, um, but I really wanna thank everybody for coming and um, Hope everybody has a great week and hopefully we'll see you next week. Next week we have, um, I believe it's, Lorraine Glasner, um, who's a, a mixed media artist who's joining us. She does a lot of encaustics on textiles. Um, so that should be an exciting talk. But uh, other than that, thanks and have a great week. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Sam. Thanks for doing that. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.